very pleasure. We could be intimate in Poplar. Randall's Market was one of them. Although it was made to, for a marketplace, it never was. It was always a place to meet the girls. Limehouse Cup was holds a lot of memories for me. The water used to come out probably from the boilers, the hot boilers, to take soap down there because we never had no baths in our house, not hot baths. Only the trouble is that the only people who used to be able to have a bath was to poke and look to swim because it was about 30 feet deep where the water was coming out of the wall. Victoria Park was my favourite. I went swimming there because it was free and it was clean. I used to swim in the Thames from Limehouse Pier. It was clean then, the Thames. Petticoat Lane never done nothing to me, nor did Brick Lane, because uh, people never went there to talk. They only went there to think that they was going to buy a bargain. I never said that about Chris Street Market. Chris Street Market was a place you went to shop anyway and meet people who you know. Most of the people who lived in the East End used to go up picking. That was the only holiday we got. I used to go over there approximately six weeks, all in Kent, round about Kent, anywhere. All the, that was a fantastic place to go to. As kids, that was just out of this world. huts about 20 foot by 20 foot. The women, when they went down, the first job was to decorate. The pigs would live in them today, I don't think. And outside, there was the big fire where everything was cooked on. Little ovens at the side, you know, where they could cook, but mostly the tea was cooked on this big fire. It was communal living at its best. I moved out of Poplar in 1950 because I couldn't find a, a house to live in. They offered me a flat and I didn't want to live in a flat. I didn't want to bring my kids up in a flat. So I moved out to Essex, to South Ockenden, and I get me living with a Ford Motor Company. Well, what Dagnum. was interesting about them? Yeah. Oh, I see Charlie Barron last night. Oh, I see Charlie Barron before Can you get hold of the other end of that? Huh? If I don't take part in any community life here, except for going to the pub or the club or somewhere like that, Esther does, my wife, because she's a school cook. There's only somewhere to live as far as I'm concerned. Oh, it's it's dry, Nick, is it dry? Of course, we have this every Friday night. <laughs> 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 they like it. Oh. Oh. It's too dry for you, isn't it, mate? It's nice, though. Yeah, it's a good taste of it, Must be glass now. Mm. Don't know. Sorry. I used to suffer with that a lot in the army, full fresh. Worst to get some just folks stuck in me out. Yeah, that's pretty jane when he comes in. What are you doing? What do you want a pearl for with hair like that? One time she's trying to take the perm out, the waves out, now she's trying to put it back again. You wake your mind up, Joe. What are she's, you going to do? She's been years trying to strain it. No, just give it up, is she? She can't beat him, Joe. <laughs> There's a keys in the car, Jane. Jane? Where are you going? They're out. They're out. Follow the cooker, you know, on the leash. Follow the cooker. Big brown towel. 
If you took falls away from this area, there'd be a lot of unhappy people, unfortunately. But it would be. Caravans and televisions all take money, and all people are interested in is making money to buy all these things. You've got to be able to live. This is the way the rest of the people live. So basically, I suppose, you've got to live that way. And they've got us all in a groove, all going the same way. used to be called Sandy Lane. Nobody seems to want this job of representative or shop steward. I suppose it goes against the grain. Everybody's not able probably to talk to the manager or doesn't want to talk to the manager or hasn't got the confidence to talk to the manager. I think working people don't think deeply, because after time, if they thought a lot deeper, they wouldn't do probably what they're doing. I've always spent a lot more of my time in London than what I have at South Hockington. It's just one of those things that's grown up over the years. I go and see my mother and father, but invariably I finish up in the headquarters in Billy's house. Only one pub. Morgan, so they said certainly, but we'll have to switch to you from first because you're the bloke. You have been back to Uber, hasn't he? Bless his house. And he Ooh. played, he played, bless his house, and a couple of farm workers stood up and sung it. Do you yeah, know the show? Right, yeah, we, we finished up with tears in our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't see us getting an house anyway because at that time they weren't building any houses in Poplar. 22 year, 23 year ago now, mm. uh, and I think I still have to stop where I am. Yeah, I think because I'm, you know, what's that about an old dog? Or an old dog don't change his spots or something. You know?
Her Majesty's third Jubilee Drive lay through the east end of London, and once again the procession took them through lanes of cheering subjects. At Whitechapel Church, their majesties changed from car to carriage. Thence they drove to Limehouse Town Hall to meet the local mayors, Stepney, Hackney, Poplar, Shoreditch and Bethnal Green. Perhaps some of the cheers this day were inspired by the thought of the Queen's birthday on the following day and we take this opportunity of offering Her Majesty our loyal greetings on this great occasion. The Mayor and Mayoress of Stepney go out to tea, and the scene is one of those happy coronation orgies in an East End street gaily decorated with flags and baby buntings are stuffing over their face. Limehouse is just another of those loyal neighbourhoods in which the children have been brought up to think of their future responsibility as citizens. Their Majesties leave 145 Piccadilly at the start of their first public engagement together of the rent, a visit to the East End. Crowds rush to see the King and Queen as their car drives at a good pace along Constitution Hill. Slowing down after leaving the city, the car draws up at the People's Palace in the Mile End Road. As the inspection of the Guard of Honour is carried out, the enthusiasm of the Loyal East Londoners gives the police a busy time. Their Majesties enter the building, maintaining a royal tradition which has been kept since Queen Victoria opened the first People's Palace 50 years ago. At last, the great scheme to turn Tower Hill into a children's playground is underway. When the bell rings, a maroon goes off, and then things begin to happen to the warehouse that's going to make way for the garden. And the good work goes on. Maroon, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it isn't our fault that they have to pull it down. Anyway, here's Godspeed to this scheme that will bring happiness to London's children. This week, Pathy's New View Spotlight introduces a Prime Minister of Duty. Off the record shots of Clement Attlee on a visit to the John Benn Hostel Stepney. Here, he's the guest of youth delegates from every part of Britain. In his speech, a success story. Lesson, there's a Prime Minister's baton in every youth leader's rucksack. Almost to the day, uh, 41 years ago, I took the step of coming down to Stepney. I got out of Stepney Station there, and I nearly walked into the cut, but not quite, <laughs> uh, in the endeavour to find my way in the fog to the Halebury Club. And having got there, I stayed there, and worked there for many years. And that was the first step that led me to number 10 Downing Street. So you none of us know what happened to you. <laughs> and with a general election four years off, he couldn't be looking for votes. For what his host thought, here are their voices from London, Scotland, Durham and Wales. How about you, Bob? What do you think of the Prime Minister coming down here tonight to give us his talk? Well, was the Prime Minister being here tonight I think that it makes the youth of Britain feel an important and an organised body. What do you think, Norman? Well, I think Mr. Utley's visit here tonight made us all feel that in future he's going to take a very personal interest in the youth of Great Britain and follow them closely. What do you think, Tom? Well, I think that it shows that the Prime Minister uh, is showing to all the youth of the country that youth work in the country is not dead and it will be kept alive as long as possible. Youth marches on. This is West India House Stepney, a £40,000 block of flats for East End families. To open it came Mr and Mrs Attlee. 27 years ago, the Prime Minister was Mayor of Stepney. Now, in the heart of London's Chinatown, he comes back as the local boy who made good. There are 31 flats in the new block to be rented at 13 and 5 pence and 16 and 6 each. It took a year to build. The 
from the official opening speech, this extract. Well, today we look around and we've seen old Stepney that we used to know departing from us. Some of it ought to have gone a long time ago. But we are now seeing the new Stepney rising and the new houses. And here is the first fruits of our activities. Good news, but only a drop in the ocean of wanted houses. Stepney gets a visit from the Prime Minister and Mrs Attlee. 200 of the borough's old age pensioners are off on an outing to Margaret, and the Attlees are there to see them off. Complete with a special gift of sweets, the pensioners, the oldest is 86, are all out for their day by the sea. It was here in London's East End that Mr Attlee began his political career. He has represented the Limehouse constituency ever since. A relic of the 1941 Blitz, a 3,000-pounder is discovered seven years after, buried in a Stepney back garden. 30 feet underground, sappers test the unexploded bomb for signs of life, and the great lift is on. The mid-morning Sabbath calm of the East End preparing its Sunday lunch is rudely disturbed as a thousand neighbouring families are evacuated to a safe distance. Everyone gets marching orders, stretcher cases included. Roads up, traffic stilled, the Royal Engineers No. 2 Bomb Disposal Squad get down to the dangerous part of removing Britain's second biggest unexploded bomb. Using compressors, Sappers drill round the fuse like burglars breaking into a safe packed with dynamite. Pathy cameraman Kenneth Gordon stayed behind to record the scene. After 90 minutes, Major Stanley Knight, the OC, picks out the fuse and everyone breathes again. Its teeth drawn, the ghost that Hitler sent to haunt the peace of a Sunday lunch is hauled out of harm's way. A brave deed that made a tenpenny joint seem a banquet, even if lunch was a few minutes late. Sharman Douglas, daughter of America's ambassador to Britain, goes to a Dr. Bernardo home in Stepney to act, together with American legionnaires, as an unofficial ambassador between the children of the two nations. With her, she brings 50 tons of toys, the gift of young Americans to orphans in Britain. With each of them comes a letter, and typical of them is this one from Michigan, which says, this is my best toy, I love it. I hope you like it too. <laughs> Lieutenant the Duke. Stage by stage, the London County Council is turning Stepney, Poplar and Bow from a maze of 19th century slums and 20th century bomb sites into an East End its people can be proud to live in. First came the Lansbury Estate, and now the second instalment, the neighbourhood of St Anne's, is inaugurated by the Mayor of Stepney, Councillor Sambrook. During the next ten years, St Anne's will replace streets like this, becoming a self-contained community for 2,200 people. More than half of these will be housed in the next two or three years. Their children will no longer have to play football among the rubbles of homes destroyed in Hitler's war. Nor will the nearest gutter be the only place for a quiet game of marbles. And when waters no longer fetch from the street, the fascist slogans will have even less appeal in an area which remembers scenes like this not so long ago. A few places suffered as badly from bombing as London's East End, and none stood up to it more bravely. The war is over, but the aftermath remains. In crumbling tenements, people who deserve better of their country the struggle to live decent lives and bring up healthy families. Here's Mrs Cunningham at home in Loxley Street, Stepney, with her son and daughter. Nowhere to hang the eternal washing except indoors. Nowhere to feed the children except among the washing. The LCC, not to mention Mrs Cunningham and her neighbours, look to the day when homes like this will be a thing of the past. What couldn't she do with a flat like Mrs. Groves? For thousands have been rehoused already under the LCC scheme, 
and Mrs. Groves on the Lansbury estate is one of the lucky ones with her family in a home that's fit for Londoners. At the rebuilt Brady Boys Club in East End London, the Duke was met by Sir Basil Henriques, President of the London Federation of Boys Clubs. For the Duke and the boys and girls of the first Jewish youth club founded in Britain, it was a happy occasion, and the Duke showed great interest in their work. From the Brady Club, the Duke went to the Lion Boys Club, Shoreditch, where he watched the boys at work mending shoes for old people. There was time for a joke, perhaps a corny one. Everything went on as usual in the games room, though the Duke was close at hand, enjoying a laugh with some of the younger lads. A rent war flared up over Dunstan Building, Stepney. For some two-room flats, the increase was about 29 shillings a week. Some tenants took a day off work to resist the bailiffs if they turned up. The landlords claimed the rents were far too low before the increase. Tenants say the... When I was a boy, people used to take any opportunity to have a party. I remember the street parties for the coronation and the jubilee. There was a piano in the street and people used to sing and dance. It was Lex, who was a Methodist minister and the mayor of Popper in 1919, who started the street parties to celebrate the end of the war. There used to be possessions as well, all to do with the church. The biggest ones used to come from the Catholic Church. And along the route, there used to be shrines and altars. In the evening, the priest used to come back, followed by a band, and bless the altars. For most people, the feeling of solidarity came from the unions. In building up the unions, they built up the community. The unions stood for the common good. Instead of being out for yourself, they stood for equality, justice and loyalty. Before 1889, there were only the craft unions, like the lightermen and watermen, which went back to the guilds. The labourers, the majority of men, weren't organised. They weren't in any union at all. They were casuals who stood on the stones and waited for a job. Ben Tillett, who was a union organiser, used to speak at dock gate meetings up and down the river. He believed, even when it seemed hopeless, that the whole of the working class had to struggle for its freedom. Then in 1889, there was a great strike for the Dockers Tanner, which was really against conditions, against the casual system. They closed all the docks and had daily marches to the city, and they even organised their own relief. After five weeks, they won the docks, Offside and General Labourers Union was formed with about 30,000 men. The lesson was you could win, but only win when you all stuck together. I 
much a bigger one. Quite like it on here. Yeah. 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 A bigger potion. Boys football, tug of war, the pram race, sideshow, stalls, mm. clowns you can put also, yeah. as you did last yeah, year, or right, yeah, right. children's entertainers. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, that one at the bottom there, Sid, that's the most important piece on it. Because as far as I can see, the H division police team mm -hmm. has uh, been scrubbed. Bit of politics, I think. But, um, It'd be nice to have them in, though, because um, they have the rope, and also because they're knowledgeable about it, you know, because they've got, they've got umpires and so on, don't they, you know. Mm. And we haven't got a clue how to run tug of war, so we... I think this was the trouble. I think last yeah. year they got a bit empty because it was more of a giggle than a yeah. pure sporting yeah. event, you yeah. know. And like a lot of sportsmen, they're um, a bit serious about their sport, you know. Mm. Well, they were, they were Metropolitan Police champions, weren't they, that time? Yeah. So yeah. They, just come they, they don't like to lose any no. ball at all, no. but yeah. even... In, in like a, f a yeah. festival, isn't it? yeah. It's a shame though because uh, it, we should have explained it to them really that it wasn't serious. You know, it's only it's only for laughs, or it's only for giggles, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Still never mind. Perhaps we'll have your horses this year. Okay, Pat. Yeah. The first one is that George Denton said, "Will you write to him, inform him, in yeah, that you wish him to apply for the license before the 11th of June." Yeah. And the second one is that uh, the judo team would like to know what type of schedule you're setting up. Who knows the length of a tug of war pitch? See, we're a little bit in the dark about tug of war, <laughs> about the pitches and how, you know. Uh, what's the distance between the marks? Who knows, anybody? We want ropes anyway, we must. Uh, we mean special rope, we always feel like yeah, it's a rope, isn't it? I don't know, I believe they are. Yeah. If we can, if you can sort of get more involved with us yeah. this way, it might be to your advantage, you know what I mean? This is it, what we were saying, if we can't get no response from our tenants, yeah. we'd rather join something else. In turn, if, if the old age pensioners could have, say, a party Christmas from your estate, say there was about 40 or 50, there's no more, is there? No. 40 or 50, you could be accommodated here. And if the tenants or your association give them the party, you know what I mean? I think this would be a good thing and all.